This video is brought to you by Mubi. Get a whole month free at Mubi.com slash MMFish. And of course, by my lovely patrons. Behind the performance. Hello, I am your host, Stella Stanisberg, and I won't be on camera today. Not for any tax-related reasons, but because we will be discussing the perfect scene partner, as brilliantly demonstrated by the incredible Clint Eastwood. An empty chair. Oh, tight. This episode I can actually watch because she's not on screen. What comes to mind when I say Clint Eastwood? A rugged, rough-and-tumble cowboy. An American icon of masculinity and individuality a respected director with an eye for understated performances and subtlety. A great gorilla song. That's probably how most people think of him. Or your dad, at least. But if you haven't kept up with his career, and I don't know why you would have, then you, my friend, are blissfully unaware of some of his latest endeavors. Fake Baby, Clint Eastwood's film, The Mule, came out in 2018, where he plays an unlikely drug courier for a cartel smuggling illicit substances. But I didn't watch The Mule for the plot. I watched because I heard that the then 88-year-old Eastwood had a threesome with two 20-somethings. What would you like? Yeah, I'll have a double. I slogged through the generic plot about an unlikable guy who chooses work over his family. Your father has always chose work over family including cartoonish representations of Mexican cartels, Bulls. slide whistle added for comedic effect, a grumpy old man complaining that this generation doesn't know how to change a flat tire, didn't your daddy teach you how to change a tire, and a smorgasbord of out-of-touch plot points that feel more like a Turning Point USA comment section than a feature film. But finally, 45 minutes later, we get to the scene. And it's pretty meh. From afar, we just see two women partying, and then in the morning, we see them leave his hotel room. And I thought to myself, that's it? I invested 45 minutes of my life into this film, and that was the threesome payoff? But then, not 15 minutes later, Clint's character ends up at another cartel party, and suddenly, a second Clint Eastwood threesome has hit the South Tower. And just to reiterate, I'm pretty sure the theme of this movie is about a guy who needs to reconnect with his family. Right Plus, you weren't there for your own daughter, and now you're letting down your granddaughter? But it's no big surprise, you know why? Yeah, why? You were never a real father or a husband. So... In all honesty, the threesomes are some of the least offensive things in this film, but it does beg the question, what's going on here? Did Donald Trump warp American culture so much that one of these seminal figures of conservative morality made a movie where he just casually bangs multiple women at the same time who are the same age as his granddaughter? And it's extra weird because, at least in my opinion, Clint Eastwood was never really a sex symbol in Hollywood. He was more like a guy that men wanted to be a sex symbol because they wanted to be him. Then, my partner mentioned, you know what's even weirder? Early in Clint Eastwood's career, he made an entire musical movie about being in a committed three-way relationship, but not with two chicks at the same time. No, 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 no. With the beautiful Gene Seberg and the beautiful Lee Marvin. Hot damn, I think it's great. It's history making. So how did Clint Eastwood go from a potential bisexual prince Never liked a man as much as I liked you to an old man yelling at a chair? I I'm not gonna shut up. It's my turn. Well, let's take a look back at his career and see if we can figure out why is Clint Eastwood Eastwood first gained notoriety on the Western TV show Rawhide. Then he made a name for himself playing the man with no name in Sergio Leone's Spaghetti Western trilogy. A Fistful of Dollars, For a Few Dollars More, and The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, which were released in the United States in 1967. Then Paint Your Wagon came out in 1969. But stuff that in your saddlebag for now, we'll come back to it later. It wasn't until a few years later in 1971 that Clint Eastwood shot to superstardom in Dirty Harry. For a description of the film, I'm just gonna read the back of the VHS box. Okay, let's see what they say. His name is Harry Callahan. He's a tough, streetwise cop, but on the force, they call him Dirty Harry. And in this film, you'll see why. 
You'll also see why Clint Eastwood's reputation is secure. Since A Fistful of Dollars in 1964, no other actor has matched his powerful, pitiless presence. Steve McQueen would beg to differ. Whenever he appears on our screen, he magnetizes our attention. In Dirty Harry, Eastwood's unique charisma comes through stronger than ever. That sounds like an egg. Clint Eastwood speaks candidly about his appeal. The secret of the man I play is that he's a superhero, a dream character for most men, Eastwood says. A guy sits in the audience. He's scared stiff about his life. He wants to be that self-sufficient legend he sees up there on the screen in my pictures. A superhuman character who has all the answers, is doubly cool, exists without society, without anyone's help. Of course, it will never happen that way. Well, at least he's being honest. In Dirty Harry, Eastwood might be giving us the hero we really want, or the hero we suspect we deserve. Did Christopher Nolan just steal that from the back of the Dirty Harry box? Either way, we can't take our eyes off him. So anyways, that's the movie. Dirty Harry was directed by Don Siegel, whose resume included the original Invasion of the Body Snatchers, not the good one with Donald Sutherland. Siegel's version was essentially Red Scare propaganda about how communism was going to destroy the fabric of American society. A moment's sleep and the girl I loved was an inhuman enemy bent on my destruction. Dirty Harry is about a San Francisco cop who has to stop a serial killer named Scorpio. The killer leaves messages for the police, taunting them and demanding ransom money in exchange for not killing more citizens. The game of cat and mouse culminates in a final showdown with the killer. There's a lot to be said about Dirty Harry as it relates to American policing philosophy. The thesis of the film is basically that cops should be allowed to torture suspects. It was produced in the wake of the Miranda ruling from 1966, the right to remain silent and all that jazz. I bet many of you didn't know how recent those rights were cemented into law, because I sure didn't. The film characterizes the district attorney and a judge as weak liberals who refuse to make the tough decisions necessary to stop criminals. This is Judge Bannerman of the appellate court. He also holds classes in constitutional law at Berkeley. These two are a stand-in for progressive reformers, butting up against the right-wing idea that policing must be punitive and is the only way to deal with crime. Now, the suspect's rights were violated under the 4th and 5th and probably the 6th and 14th Amendments. For context, when this film came out, only one San Francisco cop had ever been charged for excessive force, and that was in 1968. The cop was drunk and off duty, but still harassed and then murdered a black man. The officer was acquitted by a jury that had no black citizens. It's entirely possible that the character and storyline of Dirty Harry were partly inspired by that very case. And of course, written to reinforce the idea that cops can do no wrong. The villain in Dirty Harry is modeled after the Zodiac Killer. In order to play up the liberals are making it impossible for cops to do their job narrative, the filmmakers characterized him as a dirty leftist hippie. Scraggly hair, a giant peace sign belt buckle, and a generally obnoxious personality. We know, we've all bought weed from a guy like that. He's the perfect contrast to the soft-spoken Harry who represents law and order. The thing is, the Zodiac Killer was described as looking more like this like an accountant. And in real life, serial killers more often than not tend to look like and often idolize cops. Or sometimes, as in the case of the Golden State Killer, were literally cops. In Dirty Harry, the city of San Francisco is depicted as a dirty, grimy sewer of a place. These loonies there throw a net over the whole bunch of them. I know what you mean. The same way that San Francisco is a stand-in for liberal politics today was also true back then. The hate ashbury neighborhood was seen as one of the centers of hippie culture, and the city was already one of the more queer-friendly places in the United States. So of course, when our hero runs into a random person cruising in the park, My friends call me Alice, and I will take a dare. He replies with the same inhumane, sadistic attitude that you might expect. Well, Alice, when was the last time you were busted? If you're a vice, I'll kill myself. Well, do it at home. 
This scene is played for a joke, but in reality, the San Francisco Police Department has a legacy of exploiting and abusing people just like Alice. In the decade before Dirty Harry came out, the SFPD was rocked by the Gayola scandal, where at least seven cops were arrested on charges of extorting bribes from the owners of gay bars. And less than a decade after Dirty Harry, an ex-cop named Dan White entered City Hall with his police-issued revolver and assassinated Harvey Milk, who was the first openly gay man to be elected to public office in California, and the mayor, George Moscone. During White's trial, police officers, many of whom viewed gay people and racial minorities as invaders, wore t-shirts that said, Free Dan White. So this is not just a comic misunderstanding. It's a terrifying interaction for the young person and a terrifyingly relatable moment for queer people watching in the audience. Dirty Harry is fascinating because of the particular place it inhabits in film history. The film came out in 1971, just three years after the Hayes Code was abolished in 1968. Under the Hayes Code, Hollywood films were not allowed to portray cops as corrupt or even defeatable. Immediately after the abolishment of the code, Hollywood saw a dramatic shift in storytelling. The anti-war movement, the civil rights movement, the women's liberation movement, and the sexual revolution all contributed to Hollywood moving away from simple good versus bad storylines. And thus, the Hollywood anti-hero truly came into its own in American filmmaking. Although the groundwork had been laid in many ways by the coded language and visuals of film noir, after 1968, suddenly a whole new level of realism was available to mainstream filmmakers. They could be blunt, call out systematic corruption, and show blood, and lots of it. One of the best from this era, in my correct opinion, is Bullet, starring Steve McQueen. It premiered in 1968 and really captures that radical shift in storytelling. The film also takes place in San Francisco and follows Detective Frank Bullet, who is ordered to protect a witness. Dirty Harry almost reads as a right-winged response to Bullet where Dirty Harry points to progressive reform as the key roadblock standing in the way of public safety. In my opinion, the search of the suspect's quarters was illegal. You should have gotten a search warrant. Bullet points to systematic corruption and self-dealing politicians as the problem. Now, don't be naive, Lieutenant. We both know how careers are made. Integrity is something you sell the public. You sell whatever you want, but don't sell it here tonight where Dirty Harry explicitly glamorizes and romanticizes the idea that cops should be emotionally dead to the world. Doesn't it drive your wife crazy? No, she's dead. Bullet directly questions the dehumanizing nature of being a police officer. How can you be part of it without becoming more and more callous? Bullet's very name points to the way that the system objectifies and commodifies cops. They exist as disposable parts of a violent machine. Dirty Harry says we need a violent machine. My machine needs to be more violent than your machine. And that's how we win. This is a 44 Magnum, the most powerful handgun in the world and would blow your head clean off. Bullet also understands that serial killers don't necessarily look like this. They just as often look like members of Richard Nixon's cabinet. Bullet in other films like 1967's Point Blank starring Lee Marvin or 1971's Get Carter all question the system of authority that we live under. They all question the mythic figure of the cowboy, the hero with the gun. One of the filmmaker's main goals with Bullet was to bring more realism to the detective genre, to peel back the fantasy that the Hayes Code had turned policing into. The scenes in the morgue, the extended car chase sequence, the confidential informant, my God, that guy's look, and the forensic investigation scenes were all crafted with a clear eye for realism and detail. And I think it's worth noting, Bullet, whose goal was explicitly to show the gritty reality of policing and systematic corruption, has been kind of culturally forgotten. But Dirty Harry, who Eastwood even admitted was a dream character in a world that will never happen, continues to be a basis for modern right-wing politics. Go ahead. As in all, boys will be violent and we should be grateful movies. Women hold a special place in the plot as objects. One of the very first things we learn about the motivation behind Dirty Harry's character is that he wants to keep women safe. I don't want any more trouble like you had last year in the Fillmore district. Yeah, well, when an adult male is chasing a female uh, with intent to commit rape, I shoot the bastard. That's my policy. He just 
cares about them so much. Anyways, here's a scene where he's ogling a naked woman for his own pleasure. Hey, another threesome. You owe it to yourself to love little Harry. That's kind of what this whole movie is about. Dirty Harry's invasion of everyone else's rights. And by proxy, the audience's fantasy about invading everyone else's rights. Later in the film, Harry's supposed motivation for torturing Scorpio is to find the location of the teenage girl who's been kidnapped. The girl, where is she? But if you thought this girl was a character, think again. She's already dead. The idea of protecting a girl is just Harry's excuse for doing what he's been doing the entire movie. Violence. Anyway, let's shift gears and talk gay pioneers. So prepare yourself for the bloody mayhem and unholy carnage of Joshua Logan's Paint Your Wagon. Grab a brush and join in. Between the U.S. release of Sergio Leone's Dollars Trilogy in 1967 and Dirty Harry in 1971, Clint Eastwood was not yet typecast as the stoic action hero. Paint Your Wagon offered the opportunity to be a romantic male lead in a major motion picture, to become a masculine sex symbol in the vein of Steve McQueen or Frank Sinatra. Too bad no one checked to see if Clint Eastwood could sing. I tell you my dreams. Paint Your Wagon is the story of Ben Rumson, played by Lee Marvin, a miner looking for a new claim during the California gold rush. He saves the life of Partner, played by Clint Eastwood, whose brother dies in a wagon crash. While burying the body, they find gold in a mining town composed of all men immediately pops up around them. The relationship between Rumson and Partner is undeniably homoerotic. I uh, appreciate you saving my life and all. But you just want to know what's expected of you in return. That's right. And then one day, a Mormon arrives in town with his two wives, and the town demands that he share the wealth. Therefore, if any of you want to bid for her, so be it. The Mormon sells his wife Elizabeth to Rumson. Sold to Mr. Ben Rumson for $800! <laughs> They all realize that they're in love with each other, and so they get married and start a polyamorous life on the homestead. The film is kind of a mess. It's two hours and 40 minutes, the songs are mostly meh, and the plot meanders in a way that's unsatisfying. Lee Marvin doesn't just play a drunk, he was drunk pretty much the entire time of filming. And once again, no one checked to see if Clint Eastwood could sing. Then I got Go fever. Why did they have to screw up a perfectly serviceable wagon story with all that fruity singing? But amid the chaos are some genuinely clever ideas. Lee Marvin and Clint Eastwood's characters are about as explicitly into each other as a big budget mainstream Hollywood film would allow at the time. I get melancholy every now and then. It's a disease common to mountain men who live alone like. But if you stay with me at such, such times, uh, I'll be okay. Marvin's character refers to Eastwood only as partner. I like you, partner. I like you, Ben. They're partners in their mining claim, but also partners within their relationship. But you're still the best partner there ever was. Well... You're the only partner that ever was. Then that makes me the best. Explicitly in the throuple marriage, but even before Elizabeth comes to town, there are obvious romantic undertones. The one sacred thing, even to low scuff like me, is a man's partner. And partner, I'll swap pouches with you anytime you say. The whole film has an unbridled sense of homoeroticism, and that's besides the huge dance party full of sweaty, grizzled miners. The first female character doesn't arrive until a full 30 minutes into the movie. Paint Your Wagon originally premiered on Broadway in 1951, written by the same duo who wrote My Fair Lady, one of whom is gay. But from what I can tell, the bisexual love triangle was not a part of the original story. Between 1951, when Paint Your Wagon premiered on Broadway, and 1969, when the film version premiered at the height of the sexual revolution, the very idea of what a Western is had radically changed. And so both of the film's primary genres, the Western and the Golden Age movie musical, were collapsing. 
So it's understandable that the producers of Paint Your Wagon were scrambling to reimagine the script for contemporary audiences. The bi subtext and the love triangle seemed to be what were added to the film to make a splash and hopefully turn a profit, since it was already shaping up to be one of the most expensive movie musicals ever produced. In a biography on Clint Eastwood, film historian Richard Schickel described Paint Your Wagon as what one might expect from older Broadway types trying desperately to refurbish a decrepit property and use it to bridge the then notorious generation gap. And in many ways, I agree with that. The two reasons Eastwood signed on were because he liked the first draft before they added the three-way marriage and because he wanted a chance to sing. Reader, in a sick way, let me tell you, I'm glad we have photographic evidence proving that Clint Eastwood is not a sex symbol and has the charisma of a desk lamp. Then I'll try to find the words to say all the things you mean to me. Wow, that's almost embarrassing enough to change your entire personality and career outlook. Film critic Pauline Kael, whose opinion should always be taken with a mountain of salt, was spot on when she said of Eastwood, he hardly seemed to be in the movie. He's controlled in such an uninteresting way. It's not an actor's control which enables one to release something. It's the kind of control that keeps one from releasing anything. Eastwood doesn't give of himself ever, and a musical with a withdrawn hero is almost a contradiction in terms. Eastwood's character didn't just feel like he lacked control over the love triangle. Eastwood himself, in real life, felt like he had lost control over his own career. When he read the updated script and realized what a mess production was, he wanted to quit, but it was too late. Richard Schickel notes that Paint Your Wagon convinced Eastwood that he should only make films where he had control. This would kickstart his desire to direct. But many, many of the films Eastwood directed or produced from then on happened to characterize women in a, uh particular light. Clint made his directorial debut just two years later in 1971 with Play Misty For Me, a thriller about a radio DJ played by Eastwood, who was stalked by a crazy obsessed female fan. In 1971's The Beguiled, Eastwood faces an entire house full of crazy women. Clint Eastwood is brought to an all-girls school to become the prisoner of these man-deprived women, these man-eager girls. In 1973, Eastwood directed Breezy, the story of an older man having a relationship with a 17-year-old girl. I like to watch you dress. I like to watch you undress. In the Dirty Harry sequel, Sudden Impact, he does let a woman seek revenge. But don't worry, there's also an evil woman who doesn't conform to societal beauty standards, in case any of you female uggos get any bright ideas. In Unforgiven from 1992, a group of sex workers are characterized as unreasonable for wanting revenge after one of them is assaulted. Dirty Harry for me, but not for thee! An American Sniper is American Sniper. Fake baby! Am I saying that Clint Eastwood was so embarrassed by his role in Paint Your Wagon that he needed to hide his insecurities behind the facade of hypermasculinity? I mean, I don't know if it makes sense to argue such sweeping claims about someone's entire career and personality. But the reactionary portrayal of women and his own secure representation of archetypal masculinity seems to start right after Paint Your Wagon, continuing all the way up through whatever the mule is. Just go ahead. Do what you have to do. Maybe Clint started to realize that he was making a pattern for himself. Or maybe he wanted to prove once and for all that he could be sexy on screen. Because in 1995, he directed The Bridges of Madison County, in which he plays a photographer who's out on assignment in the middle of Iowa and hooks up with a married woman while her husband is away with the kids at the 1965 State Fair. The film is Clint Eastwood's gift to women, so don't say he's never done anything for you. Meryl Streep plays an Italian war bride with a ridiculous fake Italian accent. I'm from... I'm born in Italy. She represents the sexual repression of women in the mid-20th century America. The film is very aware that Streep's character is trapped in domesticity, and that Clint's character, as a divorced man, has the freedom to do basically whatever he wants and screw whomever he wants, whenever he wants. But the film doesn't seem very concerned with the structural forces that keep women trapped in the home. And it certainly doesn't advocate for changing any of those issues in any way. Eastwood's character, Robert, seems to pay lip service to many of the ideas of sexual liberation. It seems to me that there's too much of this is mine and he or she is mine. There's just too many lines being drawn, that kind of thing. Mm. 
But how can you live for just what you want? What about other people? I told you I love other people. But no one in particular. But I love them just the same. It's not the same. You, you know, I have a little bit of a problem with this American family ethic that seems to have hypnotized the whole country. Robert is oblivious to the systematic pressure that make men and women unequal because he benefits from the system. He's oblivious to, or pretends to be oblivious to, the interpersonal microaggressions that allow men like Robert to prey on women in very one-sided affairs. In this society, he has freedom, agency, power, and mobility. She is trapped. He risks nothing. She risks everything. She is vulnerable, and he is not. But what makes The Bridges of Madison County extra unsettling to watch is that, although the character Robert gets to come off as oblivious to the systematic oppression that women suffer from and men benefit from, in real life, Clint Eastwood was not only aware of the inequality between the sexes, he actively exploited it for his own personal gratification. Maybe it's surprising that suddenly, late in his career, a man known for playing emotionally distant men directed and starred in a film about a wandering man who falls in love with a lonely housewife. But it becomes much less surprising when you realize what had been happening in Clint Eastwood's personal life and how that role might have served to clean up his public image after going through a particularly vicious palimony trial. Palimony is like alimony, but for couples who were never technically married. Eastwood and Sandra Locke had been in a serious relationship between the mid-70s and late 80s, but never married. Looking into Clint's relationship history is a wild ride. He had an open relationship with his first wife, Maggie Johnson. He didn't divorce Johnson until 1984, after his relationship with Sandra Locke had already been going on for almost a decade. If you look at his Wikipedia, under children it says, at least eight. He also had an affair with Paint Your Wagon co-star Jean Sieber while they were filming. In her memoir, as the relationship started to deteriorate in the late 80s, Sandra Locke wrote, why did I love him anymore anyway? He had become little more than a spoiled child. There was no longer any joy. If the least little thing didn't go his way, he pitched a fit. He expected me to be loyal to the death. Even while he was mistreating me, betraying me, I was supposed to cover for him. When the couple split up, Locke sued Eastwood for palimony. Since 1967, she had been married to her gay best friend, Gordon Anderson. Adorable. Despite the fact that their relationship was non-sexual, Eastwood used this to try and claim that his own relationship with Locke didn't mean anything. Eventually, Eastwood and Locke settled. She got a few hundred thousand dollars, some real estate, and a development deal with a studio, which may seem like a good faith olive branch that Eastwood supported her career. However, Locke soon realized that the deal was a ruse so that Clint Eastwood could pay way less cash in the palimony settlement. Since the deal was allegedly made in bad faith, Locke sued for fraud. In a deposition, a producer testified that she was told by a studio executive, I want you to know that I think Sandra is a wonderful woman and very talented. But if you think I can go down the hall and tell studio head Bob Daly that I have a movie I want to make with her, he would tell me to forget it. They are not going to make a movie with her here. Locke had brought various projects to the studio, some of which eventually did get made and made lots of money, just not with her. What's striking about Locke's description of their relationship and the palimony case is the undertones of control. Eastwood exemplifies the strong, silent type. We're supposed to read this kind of character as being an island of his own, not needing other people. Clint said so as much in his own description of Dirty Harry in the back of the box. But in going through Locke's experiences, it becomes clear that refusing to speak can be another form of control. It's a way to control the flow of information. Refuse to tell your partner what you're doing, where you're going, who you're seeing. And then when your partner asks perfectly reasonable questions about what's going on, accuse them of prying or being needy or paranoid. Eastwood also allegedly exerted control over Locke's career, both while they were together and even afterwards, thanks to his powerful connections in Hollywood. Notably, Locke didn't make films with other filmmakers while she and Eastwood were together. 
From her side of the story, he shut down her career. Flint wanted me to only work with him. He didn't like the idea of me being away from him. I haven't mentioned this yet, but even though Eastwood spoke at the 2012 Republican National Convention, he's traditionally identified as a libertarian. That sort of explains why he's a bit more open about being sexually free than your average conservative. And also why he'd direct a film romanticizing a relationship with an underage girl. But a big part of his libertarian politics seems to be reflected in Bridges of Madison County. It seems to me that there's too much of this is mine and he or she is mine. There's just too many lines being drawn. Clint Eastwood is one of the most recognizable and bankable stars in Hollywood over the last half century. He had the money and power to just decide to run for mayor of the small beachside town of Carmel and easily win. He had unchecked control over the women he got involved with throughout his life. He was even able to use his power to cheat his ex-partner out of a movie deal. Eastwood is the one with the power to draw the lines, all while making an entire movie where his character philosophizes about how annoying it is that other people draw lines. We're all just trying to find the guy that did this. Eastwood tries to come off as just a guy. Just a little regular guy, you know, just a small bean little boy who wants to be left alone and wear large hats and have a bunch of threesomes. But behind all of that is a guy who's desperate for control. There's the professional control that Eastwood wanted to exert over his own career after Paint Your Wagon, the authoritarian control that Dirty Harry represents, the emotional control that Pauline Kael pointed out in Eastwood's Paint Your Wagon performance. If there's anything I know from my many years studying people on this earth, it's that when someone needs a lot of control, it's because they're afraid. Men who conflate masculinity with control are just hiding behind a fantasy, one that Eastwood freely admits will never be real. And the one time Eastwood tried to be genuine and vulnerable, he failed so spectacularly, it literally scared him straight. Well, that was 30 minutes well spent. Great. Happy Pride. So, uh, what's your deal? Uh, you know, picking up work here and there. Some weird lady posted a talking chair gig on Craigslist. Oh, no way. I was just listed on Craigslist. <laughs> uh, that's really funny. Uh, that is funny. Uh. <laughs> Whoa. As Pride Month comes to an end, you don't have to stop celebrating LGBT plus cinema and history. And one place where you can find an amazing collection of content that would make Clint Eastwood blush is Mubi, the sponsor of today's video. There's always new movies to discover, and I'm about to check out the Argentinian documentary Playback. It features found footage of Cordoba's underground queer scene after the fall of the military dictatorship in 1983. Movie is expertly curated with super helpful descriptions, so every time I browse, I find something exciting to watch that I've never even heard of before. Which is exactly how I found playback. Thanks, Mubi. Right now, you can try Mubi for free for 30 days with my link, mubi.com slash mmfish. And trust me, Mubi is the film lover's streaming service. If you're a film nut, you'll get your socks blown off by their hand-picked lineup of filmmaker retrospectives, double features, and indie flicks they find by scouring film festivals all over the world. So sign up at mubi.com slash mmfish. That's M-U-B-I dot com slash mmfish and get your month of great cinema for free. Mubi.com slash mmfish. Thank you all so much for watching and a very special thank you to all my patrons. I couldn't do this without you and everyone watching over on Nebula. And hey, if you want to see your name in the credits next to these fine folks, help me make more videos and get them before anyone else, head over to patreon.com slash Fish and sign up. Did Clint Eastwood change his entire personality because he was embarrassed one time? Go ahead and make my day by leaving your thoughts about this in the comments. And be sure you're subscribed to the channel so you don't miss my next one. If you're looking for more content about weird men, might I recommend my video looking back at The Apprentice and what it taught Donald Trump. Hint, nothing. He's always been that way. Until next time, partner. Save Martha. Thank you.